Whenever people do that, I always begin by saying, I wish we could end now. <laughs> then I could tell my wife, got a standing ovation. Uh, that doesn't always happen when it's over. Uh, really, really nice to be here. And after Mark finished, I thought to myself, we should really go straight into the Q&A. Uh, well done, Mark. Beautifully done. And, uh, you know, philosophy comes at three levels. It comes at a foundational level of argument. It comes as an illustration level of the story, and it comes at the application level of how it all applies around the kitchen table and in life. And what you heard was how best to apply it at the kitchen table level in life, but just enough of that foundation given why the argument holds and how the story is lived out day to day in business and in individual lives. We've been traveling a lot. I began some days ago, started in Dallas, Texas, and went from there to Houston, from Houston to Dunedin. And that, we had a few birthdays along the way on that one. From Dunedin, we have just come here for tonight. We leave at the crack of dawn for Kota Kinabalu in Malaysia, and then on from there to um, Thailand, and then to India, and then to Seoul, Korea but we get home about the 18th of March. So the body takes a beating, and you show up, whether in the body or out of the body, you cannot tell, but you're there. And uh, my voice took a beating, uh, but it's gradually recovering. That Manuka honey is extraordinary. <laughs> no, it's amazing, it's amazing. It's extraordinary both for the throat and for the wallet. Yeah. <laughs> especially if, they, if you believe everything you say about the numbers out there. But it's great to have had that. My wife asked me yesterday, how are you doing? I said, I don't know whether it's honey or what, but I'm doing better. And the voice is regaining. So thank you. I want to thank uh, Pastor Martin for opening this church up to us. Very kind of you, sir. Very gracious of you to do it. And also to uh, Rodney for working hard behind the scenes. I don't know how long ago all of this began. I'm just told where to go, and I show up, and um, the plane stops, so you get off. I was told that this is where we were to be. But uh, New Zealand's been one of my favorite countries. Wonderful, wonderful to come here, so beautiful. Some of my dearest friends on earth are right from here in Auckland. In fact, one of them is here tonight. I've known him for about 50 years now, and it's just wonderful to look forward to a cup of coffee at the end of the evening. We knew him well as a family friend. Uh, Bruce Robinson is here, just a wonderful dear buddy of mine. Uh, you can lead, lead a very busy life, and what really matters at the sunset here is are the loves and the friendships and the family that you have treasured and enjoyed. So it's wonderful to be here, albeit for a few short hours. And to add more beauty to it all, the two cricket teams are staying in the same hotel we are. <laughs> So that took a lot of sacrifice for me to come. Uh, I saw some of the Indian cricketers in there. I don't know what they were doing, probably scouting or whatever. Uh, I wanted to go and give them a few tips, but they didn't take it. Uh, the question before us, the whole question of ethics. So let me start off with a funny story. You may have heard me tell it. This Indian guy is in a plane, and he's sitting next to Einstein. Now you know the imagination is running riot. <laughs> so he looks at Einstein, and Einstein says to him, you know, we've got a long journey. It's going to be a long flight. Why don't we play a game as we go? So the man says to Einstein, what's the game you want to play? He says, let's play a question of questions. I'll ask you a question, and if you can't answer it, you pay me $50. <laughs> the other guy said, you're Einstein. He said, yeah, but it's okay, we'll level the playing field, and you ask me a question, if I can't answer it, I'll pay you $500. So if you can't answer it, you pay me 50. If I can't answer it, I'll pay you 500. The guy said, oh, you know, for an Indian, that's very appealing. <laughs> he said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. So he goes to town, so he tell, told Einstein, you go first, since you proposed it. So Einstein said, I'll make it simple. How far is the moon from the earth? And the Indian, you know, most Indians are engineers. So he said, <laughs> He said, you know what, I know the answer, but I don't know if I can give it exactly the way you're looking for it, so here's $50. Pay him 50 Einstein said, your question. He said, Mr. Einstein, what walks up the mountain with three legs and comes down with four legs? Einstein said, what? 
So what goes up the mountain with three legs and comes down to four legs? So Einstein started to think of his studies in entomology and all that stuff and dipped into his pocket and gave him $500. <laughs> so I looked at the Indian and said, before I ask you my next question, what does go up the mountain with three legs and come down with four legs? And the Indian gave him $50. <laughs> I was, I was in, uh, the moral of the story is don't get into a question time with an Indian, you'll never get out of it. You know. Some years ago, I just left somewhere in the Orient and arrived in Newark, New Jersey. It was a long 14, 14 and a half hour flight. You look like a passport picture when you get off that kind of a flight. <laughs> so I went to the gate and I looked at the marquee, it pointed to a different flight. So I said to the lady sitting at the corner, is this flight going where the marquee says it's going, or is it going to Atlanta, where I want to go? She said it's going to Atlanta. I said, well, that's good. So I turned around to go and get myself a cup of coffee, and I heard the patter of feet behind me. And she tapped me on the shoulder, the same lady. She said, excuse me, are you Ravi Zacharias? I said, I'm afraid so. Yes, I'm Ravi Zacharias. She said, that's amazing. That is so amazing. I didn't know you had questions also. <laughs> I promise you, I didn't make this up. <laughs> it sounds like something you would make up, you know. Questions, we're all haunted by questions. Right from the time we toddle around with the baggage around us, we're asking why, why, who, what, when, where. Even when we don't understand the clock, we say, when are you coming back? We understand very little about so many things, and we actually think we know a lot about everything. Before my father passed away, and it's a long story, my dad and I didn't have a good relationship in my youth, and he had every reason to be very angry with me many of the times. But before he died, he asked me to take him to the hospital. He had a premonition that he was not going to come through that surgery. And I lived 75 miles away in Niagara Falls, Ontario. My dad was in Toronto. And all of my brothers and sisters were in Toronto, 10 to 15 minutes away from him. But he phoned me to ask me if he'd come and take him. I said, Dad, it'll take me at least an hour and a half if I leave right now. You better get to the hospital right away. Call Ajit, he'll take you, my older brother. He said, no, I want you to come. So I drove. And as I was driving him to the hospital, I realized why he'd asked me for that. And one of the main things he wanted to say to me was to apologize for the hard years in my youth where he'd roughed me up pretty bad, pretty bad. But then the fascinating thing about what he said to me was he said, you know, son, I always thought I knew so much. Always thought I knew so much. And when I looked at your life, I thought you were going to be a total disaster. I was just trying to shame you into reality. I didn't see what your heavenly father saw. And I just want to say I'm sorry. We think we're all mistakes. You do it, I do it. We think we know so much. And I want to talk to you tonight about one of the most important questions, but I'm going to flip the response after I raise the question in order to deal with this issue of ethics, meaning, and purpose. C.S. Lewis said, when a ship goes on to the high seas, it has to answer three questions. Number one, how to keep from sinking. Number two, how to keep from bumping into other ships. The first issue deals with personal ethics. The second deals with social ethics. How to keep from sinking, how to keep from bumping into other ships. He said, but then comes the most important question. Why is it out there in the first place? <laughs> Why is the ship on the high seas in the first place? He said, that is essential ethics. That gives you the essence from which you derive the personal and the social ethics. And the truth of the matter is, when you go across the history of philosophical thought, whether you move from rationalism to empiricism to existentialism to postmodernism, many of those isms made one fundamental blunder 
in taking the finger of one discipline, they thought they were grabbing the fist of reality. In taking the finger of one discipline, they thought they were grabbing the finger of reality. Yes, there is a place for rationalism, meaning reason has a supremacy in dialogical discourse. Yes, there is a place for empiricism. You walk into the lab, and you measure what happens when A is joined to B. The scientist does that all the time. But please take note, the scientist may know what happens when you put A and B together, but there's nothing in science that gives him the imperative as to why he should tell us the truth. That is not f from physics. That is metaphysics, or dare I suggest, those are transcendent spiritual realities which make a reference to an objective moral framework that must superintend over everything that we do, whether it's in the lab or outside of the lab. So yes, there was a place for empiricism. Existentialism, will, meaning, yes, a place for that. And then you come to postmodernism where community became so important. But somewhere between the middle of the 19th century and the end of the 19th century, a philosophy was taking hold that was popularized by the German philosopher Nietzsche, who popularized the phrase, God is dead. Now, ironically, Nietzsche was the son of a pastor, and both of his grandfathers were in the ministry. But he lost his faith in God. And the ironic thing about him is he did say this, if what I'm saying is true about the death of God, two things are going to happen in the 20th century, the next century. Number one, a universal madness will break out. And number two, the 20th century will become the bloodiest century in history. He was right on both counts. In a sense, he embodied the first, the last 13 years of his life. He himself was moving between sanity and insanity as his mother sat by his bedside watching this brilliant mind waste away. And in the 20th century, we killed more people than the previous 19 centuries put together in warfare. Turned out to be right. But this is how he said it. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours? And he ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I'm looking for God, I'm looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing together there, he excited considerable laughter. Have you lost him then, said one. Did he lose his way like a child, said another. Is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage or emigrated? Thus they shouted and shouted and laughed him to scorn. But the madman sprang into their midst and pierced them with his glances. Where is God? He cried. I shall tell you, we've killed him. You and I. We are all his murderers. But how did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Notice the series of metaphors and the questions here now. Whither are we moving now? Away from all suns? Are we not perpetually falling backwards and forwards and sidewards in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not suddenly become colder? Is not more and more night coming on us all the time? Must not lanterns now have to be lit in the morning hours? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God's decomposed too, you know, and he's dead. He remains dead and we kill them. Now, how shall we, the murderer of all murderers, compose ourselves? That which was holiest and mightiest of all that the world yet possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water can we purify ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What sacred games will we need to invent? Is not this the greatest of deeds too great for us? Must we not, now not ourselves have to become God simply to seem worthy of what we've done? There's never been a greater deed, you know, and whoever shall be born born after us for the sake of this deed would be part of a higher history than all history hitherto. But this tremendous act is still on its way, still traveling and has not yet reached the years of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars require time. Deeds require time, even after they are done. It has been related further that on the same day that this madman entered diverse churches and there sang a requiem, Eternum Deo, let out and quieted, he said to have retorted each time. What are these churches now? 
if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God. God is dead. We killed him. You know what I like about Nietzsche? He's not just poignant. There is a vulnerability in what he is saying. Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the horizon? Is there any up or down left? Have you noticed in politics it's only right and left? There's never an up and a down? Oh, he's a right winger. He's a left winger. We never ever talk about an up and a down. And as Mark as well said, because that would be considered almost lunatic. And yet what we've really done is demonstrated the lunacy of how we live without an up and a down, without a transcendent moral point of reference. And so four things happen. I will mention the first two quickly and then the the briefly, a little more than uh, briefly, and the last two I will keep very brief. The first is this. If God is dead, what will become the point of reference for moral reasoning? Where do we turn to? I know philosophers have tried to. There was one guy in Dunedin who said he could actually come up with a superior moral and morality with secularism. How ludicrous. Why? How does he know it's superior? If there's no point of reference, how is it superior? It's his point of self-referencing maxims. That's all it is. Platitudes. Why is my ethic any better than your ethic? What audacity for me to say that I have a superior ethic to yours. Try telling that to some people who are willing to lop your head off if you actually believe that. The fact of the matter is Philosophers have struggled and struggled with this issue. And I want to read just one or two statements from staunch atheistic philosophers. Here's Kai Nielsen, the prolific atheist from the University of Calgary in Alberta. Here's what he says. We have not been able to show that reason actually requires a moral point of view. Oh, that really rational persons unhoodwinked by myth or ideology, need not be individual egoists or classical amoralists. Reason doesn't decide here. The picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on this depresses me deeply. Pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Bertrand Russell says this, you know what? I somehow cannot live as though ethical values were simply a matter of my personal taste. And so I just say to you, I find my own views incredible. I do not know the solution. Prolific atheistic philosopher Richard Rorty, if moral imperatives are not commanded by God's will, and if they are not in some sense absolute, then what ought to be is a matter simply of what Uh, men and women decide should be for themselves. There is no other source of judgment. These are atheistic philosophers. This depresses me, says Kai Kai Nielsen. There is no rationally compelling reason for me to be moral. And you know what? That was the very rationale behind the Hitlerian onslaught in the Third Reich. He took the writings of Nietzsche, Adolf Hitler did, and personally presented Nietzsche's writings to Stalin and Mussolini. What did Stalin do? He was a seminary student preparing for the ministry. I heard these stories personally from the mouth of Malcolm Muggeridge when we spent an afternoon together. Followed it up and footnoted it. Paul Johnson, the historian, also tells these two major stories. Number one is this. You know, he gave up his belief in God. In fact, he was such a threat to what potentially could happen with his own demagoguery that even Lenin became fearful of where Stalin was going to take the country. He was not a big guy. Stalin was not even his real name. It was a nickname, being a man of steel. Two illustrations I want to give to you that I shared at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow. As the faculty members were in spin-drop silence, as I gave it to them all along, they've been fighting me with their atheistic worldview. So I said, I want to tell you two stories. One of them was on site. I told one of them in the whole setting, one of them in the private setting. I had to be very careful how we narrated this. 
One was this. A diplomat came to Stalin one day and said to him, how do you expect your people to follow you while you're torturing them like this? Stalin didn't answer her. He asked for a live chicken to be brought to him. They brought him a live chicken. He clutched it and started to defeather the bird. And it tried to break free. He wouldn't let it go till he had completely denuded it. Then he took that denuded body of the chicken and put it down, picked up a piece of bread and walked away about five paces. And the chicken hobbled over towards him and nuzzled, nuzzled between his trouser legs. He bent down with the bread in his hand and started to peck away at the bread. He said, do you have your answer, ma'am? I've tortured this chicken. It'll follow me for food the rest of its life. People are like that chicken. You torture them and they will follow you for food the rest of their lives. And he killed 15 million of them. Stalin told me he personally interviewed Svetlana. I mean, um, Mugridge told me that when Stalin was dying, his daughter, Svetlana, was by the bedside and told Mugridge this story and in a BBC narrative. He told it. So she's standing by her father's bedside and he's hallucinating, saying wolves were coming to attack him. But the last physical act he did was to half sit up in bed, clench his fist at the heavens one more time, put his head back on the pillow and he was gone. The last physical energy he expended with a clenched fist against God. He took the logical outworking of what Nietzsche had said and treated man as nothing more than mere randomly produced by time plus matter plus chance. See, you may be a moral person, and I'm not saying atheists are not moral people. That's not my point at all. I'm just saying there is no rationally compelling reason in a pluralistic society for anyone's ethic to be superior to anybody else's ethics. They're all a whim of society and social constructs and culture. The moral reasoning fails. Where do we get our ethics from? Number one, you fail in a finding an absolute point of reference for a moral law. Number two, you fail in your struggle, a very important struggle for meaning. Life hungers for meaning. I can tell you this after visiting scores of campuses after 40 years of an itinerant. We really don't hear a new question. My Margaret used to say, all new news is old news happening to new people. <laughs> and so the new people keep asking the same question. And you know who are the loneliest ones in our world today? Either the high and mighty who have it all in fame and success and fortune, or the young who've enjoyed and indulged so early in life, they've come away empty-handed and they say, what have I got? What have I got? When I was a young speaker starting out living in Toronto, Canada, I was driving on the 401 highway in Toronto once. It was a cold, wintry, snowy night. And on the side of the highway, there was a boy just relatively swaggering on his legs. I thought, what is he doing on a snow drifting night on the highway? He's going to get crushed. So I gradually, you've got to be careful in those icy roads. I pulled over on the side. And I waited till he came over. I said, are you okay? He said, can you take me home? I said, where are you going to? He told me where he was. I wasn't going in that direction. I said, get in the car, I'll take you. His first name was Lorne. And I started to talk to him, and he looked like a man in deep trouble. I said, Lorne, I'd love to get together with you if you don't mind. Here's my phone number, here's my address, give me yours too. I'm leaving early tomorrow morning to Midwest Canada. I'll speak there when I come back. I'll get in touch with you. He said, you're a kind man. Thank you. Thank you. I dropped him off at home. It was too late. By the time I came back a week later, he had burned himself to death. But not before he mailed a piece of poetry that he'd written and sent it to me. Lost in a world of darkness, without a guiding light, seeking a friend to help, my struggling, failing plight. So all of you good people just go on passing by, leaving me with nothing but this lonely will to die. For somewhere in this lonely world of sorrow and the woe of woe, there's a place for me to hide, but where, I do not know. For no matter where I go, I never will escape the devil's reaching, clutching hands or the drink of fermented grape. So maybe out of my grief and anguish, some poor wandering boy will see 
and build his own life pure and good and free. He become a slave to his habits. I've met young men, and remember my colleagues who travel with me will tell you, whenever I tell them my story of trying to kill myself at the age of 17 and how I came to know Christ on a bed of suicide, there's always somebody in the audience who stands in line and tells me, you know what, I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling with the same thing. The suicide rate in Belgium is so high right now that they are not calling it suicide anymore. They are calling it opting out of life. Opting out of life. Meaning, that hunger for meaning. Why am I here? What are the high seas about? Why am I out here in the first place? Moral reasoning demands we give an answer to life's essential worth and meaning. And I've said this in many, many places. You see, God gave Moses 613 laws. It's a lot of laws. But now we need 20,000 pages just for our health care laws. You know. <laughs> Why? Because we broke one. What was the one law? He had only given one prohibition when it all started. What was it? Don't play God. Don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because do that, you're going to die. And what does the tempter say? Oh, no, 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 you're going to become a God. Do it, you're going to become God. We made quite a mess of this world playing God. Now you need three conditions just when you get onto a plane. Do not touch, tamper, disable, or destroy. Four conditions. The smoke detector. Why don't they just say don't mess with it? Why touch, tamper, disable, destroy? Because you see, you can go to court and say, yeah, I did destroy it, but I didn't tamper with it. <laughs> and all the word games we start to play, to give truth to him who loves it not, is to only give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretations, as George MacDonald. You can play games in a courtroom and abuse the law. So 613 laws, all being abused. And what does um, David do? He reduces them to 15. Isaiah to 11. Micah to 3. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. Jesus was asked which of the greatest commandments. You know he could have given you one. But he didn't. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, says he, hang all of the laws and the prophets. Because of the first, the second follows. Without the first, the second would be with its feet firmly planted in midair. The vertical gives you the imperative for the horizontal. That's when you find meaning. When God says to you and to me that we are created in his image. Which gives me moral reasoning and self-determination. The hunger for morality, the hunger for meaning. Thirdly and quickly, the hunger for hope. That life ought not to end with its three score years and ten. Or justice would have been prostituted and violated. There is an eternal judge. But I close with just the fourth. What is the greatest longing of your heart and mine? If you are dead honest, what is the greatest hunger and longing in your heart and mine? You know what it is? It's for the supreme ethic we call love. I want to give you a couple of illustrations. You know, I grew up in India. And uh, those of you who speak Hindi, I'm a person of the soil. And uh, there's a Hindi song that says, Na mai bhagwan hu, na mai shaitan hu, june dunya jo chahe, samjho mai to insan hu. I'm not God. I'm not Satan. I'm merely a human being. Now, Indian movies <laughs> are now being imitated by Hollywood. We had people stealing the Taj Mahal in the movies and returning it the next morning. <laughs> Batman does the same thing. They've just borrowed all this stuff that Indian movies have been doing for years, but there's one thing Indian movies did which were quite fascinating. There was no kissing on the Indian screen. They just chased each other around during a song. You know? 
And by the time he would catch up with her, the scene would change. <laughs> there was a great Indian comedian by the name of I.S. Johar. He was asked, what is the difference between love on the Western screen and love on the Indian screen? He answered in one word, trees. <laughs> you just chase each other around trees and that's the love scene, you know. But it's fascinating in a culture in which you were never allowed to hold her hand or look more than 10 seconds that we do so many movies on love. The movies on love that, I mean, the, if you understood the language, it's so beautiful the way they express themselves. Do you really see it in real life? My brother-in-law, Sundar Krishnan, is a Hindu convert, nuclear physicist turned pastor. Some of you may know his name. Brilliant expositor, married to my sister. His father was dying in his 85th year. And at the bed, he called his wife beside him. And in the Tamil term, he called her his sweetheart. And he said, I know this is the first time I have ever called you that. We long for it. The cultural constraints sometimes handcuff us. My little grandson Jude, he's an amazing little boy. You know, a corporal once said to Winston Churchill, Sir, have I ever told you about my grandchildren? Churchill said, No, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to tell you too much about grandchildren. But my grandson Jude, he's quite a character, he's five years old. He sits around the table and he'll talk up a storm. One day he looked at me and he said, Papa, what is the meaning of sophomoric? I said, what? I said to my daughter, where does he pick up all these words? Sophomoric? I sounded sophomoric trying to define it for him. But here's the little guy. He thinks so deeply, he will shock you with the things he will say to you. When he was three and a half, my daughter Naomi is a wee little gal, beautiful gal. She'd lost her car keys and running around the house couldn't find it, slapped her forehead and said, I must be losing my mind. And Jude came and stood in front of her and said, Mommy, whatever you do, please don't ever lose your heart because I'm in there. Aww. Three and a half year old boy. Who taught him that? Who taught him that? Three and a half years old. My father-in-law died at the age of 85. He was an engineer with Shell all his life. One of the finest men I ever knew, Lindsay Reynolds. Had four daughters. The biggest grilling I ever took in my life was when I asked him for permission to marry his daughter. No. <laughs> the questions he asked me, I thought, my goodness. I thought, pre-med was tough. <laughs> when he was diagnosed with a tumor in his kidney, from diagnosis to death, it was four months. He was 85, and he shriveled down to a bag of bones. I'd say Bruce was in the audience, knew him well. While he was wasting away, he couldn't speak anymore. And he was silent for days. I flew out to have some meetings. I told my wife, I said, honey, I'll be back. Three days. I hope your dad can hang in there. He's really not saying anything anymore. So I flew back. When I arrived, she said, you missed it. He died just a couple hours ago. She said, Ravi, I've never seen anything like it in my life. He'd been silent and his eyes opened. And he looked towards the ceiling and he said this, that's amazing. That's just amazing, as he looked to the heavens. And then he looked at his wife of 60 plus years and he said, Jean, I love you. And he was gone. He honored two of the greatest trusts, his love for God, whom he was going to see, for I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And he honored his earthly commitment of loving his spouse. 
in this world without God, where are we going to find our definition for love? If we don't go to agape, for God so loved the world that he gave, for God so loved the world that he sent his son, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The love of Christ on the cross with the arms outstretched that says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing is the most unique concept of coherence of God's creation, the incarnation, the transformation, and the consummation that he brings in your life and mine. With that coherent worldview, we know why we are out on the high seas in the first place. And that helps us to keep from sinking and to keep from bumping into other ships. And it is Christ who commands me to even love those with whom I disagree. So I say to you, without God, moral reasoning, without God, meaning, without God, hope, without God, love, how do we design, define those four categories? without God. Morality, hope, meaning, and love. With God, all of those are pregnant with meaning and give you the fulfillment for why we are out here in the first place. We will be delighted to answer your questions. Mark and I have agreed he'll take all the tough ones. I'll take the simple ones. So God bless you.